Okay. We are just about at four o'clock, five p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, welcome, everyone. Hola, hola a todos y bienvenidos. This is our uh, fourth PCBH webinar, which is titled BHDs Ponte Las Pilas, a quick start guide to conducting behavioral health consultations in Spanish. This will be a bilingual webinar. Um, my name is Clarissa Aguilar, and I am the current 2019-2020 co-chair for the Primary Care Behavioral Health Special Interest Group. Today, we have quite a few speakers uh, that will be providing some content for us, and sentimos bien emocionadas de estar aquí con ustedes. Um, estamos aquí porque comprendemos que podemos escuchar los voces de los ancianos diciendo, ponte las pilas, PhD, and now is the time to do it. Um, we've had a tremendous showing and interest in coalescing our resources to elevate the quality of the care that we provide in Spanish. And um, most importantly, there's been a big, strong need to help and support each other in this work. So uh, we hope that what we have in store for you today can really do that. Um, I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to receive clinical supervision in Spanish, but um, it was my hope that this webinar would be a version of that, to actually have an opportunity to hear clinical work that occurs in Spanish uh, that is not your own voice, um, that can be very helpful. It's a very special thing and it's a very meaningful thing, and I just want to express my gratitude to CFHA um, for providing us this forum and allowing um, this kind of specialized uh, training to occur. And um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers. So, um, you know me, um, I am the Director of Psychology and Training at the Center for Healthcare Services, which practices the primary care behavioral health model in a bi directional setting. We also have Dr. Yahaira Johnson Esparza, who is an assistant professor um, at the Department of Family and Community Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Um, we also have with us uh, the director of clinical social work at Fidel Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin, Donna Shainer, who is an LCSW. Myra Bailon is Joining us from Chicago, uh, she is a behavioral health consultant at Prime Care Health, which is a QHC in Chicago. And then we have Norma Bayi Borero, who is a um, LPC intern and is working now at the King Clinic, that's where she does behavioral health consultation and uh, some psychotherapy as well. So we're very excited um, to have everybody here. So our objectives today are to provide you with resources, concrete handouts, speakers for your practice, and to provide sample scripts of clinical BHC work in Spanish. And then, of course, it was important that I wanted everybody to be able to identify each other for uh, support and help um, to do this important work in Spanish. Um, this is the outline of the things we're going to be covering today. We're going to have um, our task force leader, um, saludarnos y contamos una historia. And then we're going to um, kind of go through all of the core components of BHC visits, um, health issues of the month we're also going to cover, and then kind of talk about future directions. So without further ado, Norma. Hello, everyone. So you may even find yourself in this lovely picture of us from CFHA if you were able to attend in Denver. Um, so I am here with Yahida. We found out that we work uh, in the same hallway, so that was fun. And um, we wanted to announce that our, you know, our task force has become an official working group. And you may have received this email. Uh, from myself or uh, from Marta um, from CFHA and so basically 
what a working group is, um, it's a group that has all the benefits of being a SIG without having to get all of the uh, charters and approval from the board that you would need for an official SIG. And CFHA policy is that we'll be a working group for one year. And during that time, they'll see how we grow, what our needs are, what we develop, and then we may become uh, an official SIG. So Yahida and I are the co-facilitators and we have our official meeting next week to plan our agenda for the year to come. So a lot of the ideas that we all shared and uh, brought up in Denver will be discussed and we will be touching base with um, y'all soon and CFHA at large to keep moving us forward. Back to you, Dr. Aguilar. No, it's still me. Okay, just kidding. <laughs> all right, so also if you were in Denver, you might have caught this story, but how it all began. Uh, so we have uh, in CFHA the lovely email listserv, which I'm sure has helped all of us at some point answering you know tough questions about a patient or billing or you know everything that comes up from working in a clinic and one lovely soul sent an email asking if the phq9 was available in spanish and so there's our phq9 i being you know a lovely brunette that's me at my computer um saw this email and was very upset because um one, PHQ-9 is available in many languages, and two, Spanish is so prevalent. There's so many you know, of us in the Latino community, and being a Latina myself, I felt um, you know, disappointed, right? Your parents aren't angry, they're disappointed. Disappointed that this was a question um, that someone had, that they didn't already know that this was available. So I responded um, with, asking if any other Spanish speaking BHCs were going to attend Denver. Um, and I think I had another question in there, but it basically ended with how do you introduce yourself as a BHC in Spanish? Because that's something over my internship uh, that I, I, you know, kind of struggled with. I changed it many times because I would get different reactions from my patients based on what words I used. Um, so that led to this wonderful email conversation that just exploded on the listserv, which is all of, you know, the lovely little people with their talk bubbles, and then uh, culminated in our wonderful meeting in Denver, where we all put our heads together and came up with this group, this idea. Yes, thank you, Norma, for that story. It is really important. Um, before we kind of launch into the content, I just wanted to acknowledge, as Norma was saying, you know, this is a, we know that the Latino population is growing. When I look at this slide, I think about all of us that are tuned in um, from every part of the country. You know, we know that in the Southwest, there's a lot of Latinos, but all those little blue and light yellow areas, kind of like we're looking at all of us right now, trying to come together to do this important work. But I also wanted to quickly recognize that there are a lot of very different and often unspoken variables that come into play when we think about the use of Spanish in the medical setting. Um, these are some kind of historical pictures about the history of the US, which some of it is not so pretty or favorable. Um, because all of this really influences the way we use Spanish today in our world and the way we've learned Spanish. And I know for me, um, kind of speaking for myself, I've had a lot of my own issues trying to use Spanish because of my Tex-Mex. I grew up on the border and I've been called a few things and my Spanish has been called a few things. And so it does and did affect the way that I came into using the language clinically. But there are lots of variables and they're kind of throwing them all on here to kind of say that all these factors really have and make a difference in the way we use the language and the way that we speak. Um, and these are all kind of psychological variables. I know that we all have talked about, well, you know, we, are, we know conversational Spanish, but we don't really know the academic clinical Spanish. Spanish is a Spanish I learned in my home and not necessarily what I learned in school. Uh, there's lots of different generational differences, the use of our accents. And these are variables, like I said, that people don't really speak to, but it is important, you know, 
um, that we recognize those things have an impact. And that's even without addressing all the different diversity and heterogeneity within the Latino population. So we also know that that is another big variation in the way that we use languages. So I just kind of want to put that out there, make sure that we acknowledge all those things as we move forward and go into our um, discussion today. So I'm going to be now handing this over. We're going to be moving to through our uh, core components of the BA. I got my bonus going to take us through uh, the greeting where I'm going to be reviewing some assessments and screeners. We're going to be talking about how to use a contextual interview in Spanish using smart goals and some interventions as well. So, not bad. Hola, muy buenas tardes a todos. Uh, Myra here again from Chicago. And so I'll be going over the key components of a Spanish introduction, just some of the main things to consider mentioning when meeting a patient. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And before, I mean, as you all can see, the first thing on this slide is identifying a title. And before I get into the entire slide, I, I just want to mention what um, Norma brought up earlier how the thread and the CFHA lister brought about a lot of conversation about different titles and how other BHCs call themselves in Spanish. Um, it was a lot of responses. So thank you, Norma, for bringing that question up. And in, I believe last year, it was also a question that was brought up in the listserv. So that was another thread with more responses too. And so people are wondering, you know, how are, how should we be introducing ourselves? Because there is no uh, BHC title officially in Spanish. Um, and during the task force, for those of you that went to Denver, um, during the task force group uh, for Spanish speaking BHCs, I believe someone even brought up the question of whether there would be a standardized way of same BHC in Spanish, but as of now, there isn't. So here in this PowerPoint slide, you all can see different titles. Um, I personally use uh, Consultante de Bienestar. Sometimes I can, I'll walk into a room and be very general and say, yo soy la persona que me enfoco en el bienestar de los pacientes. So not, try not to use too much lingo. Other titles that people use, uh, consultante de salud, especialista de salud, proveedor de salud, consultora de salud del comportamiento, a little bit lengthier. Um, and then some other ones that, for those of you that did not keep up with the lister thread that were mentioned then were proveedor de salud conductal, proveedor de salud emocional, especialista de conducta, so different terms. And one that I remember from 2018 uh, from that thread was consultante de salud Salud Integral. So uh, not one title for everyone, but um, the key things to keep in mind when figuring out the title to use is one, making sure it feels comfortable to you and that it makes sense to patients. Um, and also being mindful of words like terapeuta, terapista, consejera, or consejero. Uh, I find that a lot of times patients still feel a little ambivalent when they hear those titles as to that then alludes to long-term therapy. And uh, for example, at our clinics here at Prime Care, we use a PCBH model. So um, I try to stay away from those terms because then that is not essentially the, the work that I'm doing long-term treatment. So those are some key titles, um, some, some titles that are, uh, that are used. Um, the second part of an introduction that's helpful is clarifying the purpose of your role, of course. You know, something that I usually say is, me encargo de apoyar a los pacientes a mejorar la salud y bienestar, or trabajo con pacientes para mejorar la salud física y emocional. Um, another component, of course, is mentioning that you're part of the team and working in collaboration with all the medical providers. Um, you know, soy parte del equipo de toda la clínica. Trabajo en colaboración con todos los doctores y doctores, doctoras de la clínica. And for example, like at my clinic, I am the only BHC. And so mentioning this is important because if I do have a warm handoff and I have an interruption, then it kind of indicates to the patient, oh, she was right. She does work with other doctors here, not just mine. Um, normalizing, of course, that you see all patients can be very helpful. Of course, this would be very different if, for example, you're working in a peds um, clinic or just seeing adults, but oftentimes, for, for at least in my clinic for family medicine, so I will tell patients, you know, veo a todos los pacientes aquí de la clinica, niños, adolescentes, adultos y personas mayores, so that they know I'm not just seeing them, um, it's everyone. 
In the last two parts, um, I, of course, emphasize that as a BHC, you see patients for non-mental health reasons. I always bring this up first, of course, and, and mention, you know, I see people with diabetes, alta presión, dolores de cabeza. If there's a, if there's a particular reason that, that they're being referred to me, for example, um, you know, they're feeling fatigued, you know, I'll mention that part in the medical part. So I'll give different examples. Um, I won't just say, you know, you're being referred for depression. I'll always mention different ones. Um, and of course, what I just mentioned, you know, men mentioning the men mental health conditions that um, you see people for, you know, miro a pacientes que padecen de estrés, nervios, ataques de nervios, o depresión. Um, so different ones, so I just, so they can see, oh, Myra does see every, you know, all patients with different conditions. And oftentimes by the time I'm done with the spiel, you know, what what's helpful about mentioning all these different um, reasons that we see patients for is patients usually will then kind of feel like relieved, like, oh, so you don't, you don't just focus on depression, you focus on everything. And even body language changes in patients when, I, when I'm done with that spiel. Um, next slide, please. So this is more, uh, by the way, this is a, a picture of Clarissa <laughs> doing an intro. That's not me. Um, great picture. Uh, but this is a, like a condensed version of a paragraph of what I would say. And typically, spiel is usually like about a minute, minute and a half. Um, sometimes, of course, condensed depending on the flow of the clinic. But in, in a nutshell, you know, I, you know, this is how I would say it. You know, la buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Mayra Bailón. Soy la consultante de bienestar aquí de la clínica de Prime Care, which is where I work, of course. Tengo entendido que el doctor o la doctora Jones la recomendó para una consulta conmigo por dolores de cabeza, o se ha sentido fatigada, uh, desanimada. You know, I'll mention the reason for referral here. Um, por lo que veo, esta es la primera vez que la conozco, así que déjeme le, le digo lo que hago aquí en la clínica. And again, I'll incorporate the different um, components of the Spanish introduction. Um, so that's in a nutshell some of the key components of what to go over in a first intro meeting with a patient. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Maida, for that uh, very concise and helpful introduction in Spanish. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time to go through some of the screeners that are available and assessments um, that can be used as part of your VHC visit. So jumping right into questionnaires that can be very helpful, this is probably the most frequent form I use at my in my setting. Um, this is called the Patient Stress Questionnaire, and it was um, developed by the University of Massachusetts, but was has been kind of pushed out to people doing integrated care through SAMHSA, uh, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration. And I um, used them as a resource to, to start using this particular questionnaire. I love this because this those first nine questions are the PHQ-9, as we know. The next seven questions are the GAD-7 on page one. Uh, the next question is one specific pain question that kind of just lets you know if they're in physical pain uh, right now. And then uh, the next four questions uh, at the top of page two are the PTSD-PC, which is the primary care screen for uh, PTSD. And then this last section is the audits, which we all know very well, which is our screening for alcohol use. And so this actually doesn't take very much longer than the PHQ-9. People um, go through it really quickly, and it provides you with a really nice snapshot um, and a very you know, easy way to assess a lot of different conditions all at one time. The only issue about the patient stress questionnaire is that it doesn't have this particular functional item which is part of the PHQ-9, and although it doesn't go into the scoring of the PHQ-9, it does kind of help you understand how much symptoms are affecting status. So I typically, once I pick up the pain stress questionnaire, um, ask this question, uh, which gets me, you know, kind of started to talking about some of their symptoms. Um, this is the PHQ-15, which is the, um, from the PHQ family of measures, um, this is, you know, from the www.phqscreeners.com uh, that Norma was referring to earlier. The PHQ-9, the PHQ-15, the GAT-7, they are all available in many different languages besides Spanish. 
But this one is something that I use a lot with my Latino population because it does help me understand if there are a lot of physical symptoms happening. Um, and sometimes I use it instead of the THQ9 because people aren't or can't really identify um, emotional or other symptoms, but they are able to really easily identify physical symptoms. And that's always helpful for me to know. Um, the THQ15 has scores of 5, 10, and 15, which represent the cut points for low, medium, and high somatic symptom severity. Um, this next little, this is kind of moving to children's now, and I didn't um, bring in all of every single Spanish questionnaire, but these are some that I thought would be really useful for folks. I love the the pictorial pediatric symptom checklist. Now, this is a longer checklist, but I know that a lot of you that are working in pediatric settings, the, the PSD might already be incorporated into the way that you all do well visits um, with children. And so this is available, it's free and uh, downloadable. And I love it because it's not only um, available in Spanish, but it's also very visual. And so that is great. Um, and then here's the M chat, which is a modified checklist for autism in toddlers, um, that push up, which also has a lot of validation behind it as well in Spanish. Um, and all of this is also downloadable uh, for free as well. Um, the next are these substance use screeners, um, which, you know, I don't use the cage aid very much, but it is available. I typically use a different kind of screener. Um, but this cage aid is great. It comes in Spanish and you're able to use it. And then the, this other assessment is the Carlos, which is the craft in Spanish. And, you know, the craft is an acronym. And in this case as well, the Carlos is also an acronym, which means, uh, stands for the carro, if there's been any, you know, vehicular accident, amigos, relajarse, líos o problemas. Um, if you've olvidar, si has olvidado algo, um, and then also solo. So, so those are the um, acronyms for the Carlos. That is a self-administered um, adolescent screen for substance and alcohol use. Um, and so you can use this with patients between the ages of 11 and 21. So it's really helpful and can be very easy to score as well. Um, all right, so moving right along going to be handing this over to Norma, who's actually going to be taking us through the rest of the webinar. All right. Oh, sneak. Hide your eyes. Spoilers. <laughs> okay. Let me see. There we go. <laughs> uh, there we are. Hello again. There we are. Okay, I got it. All right, so, and can everyone hear me? Can someone, oops, no, my pod. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So now I realize sharing my screen, I can't see if I muted myself. So here is the tried and true contextual interview. Um, for me and my visits, this has definitely been the meaty portion where you get to get most of the information you need from or that I need from the patient and while I'm sure most of us have this memorized by now I think it's good to have it written uh, in Spanish especially for those of you who are training uh, new BHCs or have um, you know others in your clinic that would like to learn more you know if you're looking into starting a health coaching program to just have it already ready to go so we have the love work play amor trabajo juego and then comportamiento de salud so asking about you know um, smoking drugs drinking and then also um, you know sleep how is food you know meals going and then um, we introduced a new uh, acronym DEC uh, um, for the three T's sort of time trigger trajectory so we have duración eventos and cursos so the the course of you know how the the problems are going in their lives um, then I am not sure who of you have been 
lucky enough to be trained with MPI, but this was a wonderful new discovery for myself. And I believe Dr. Aguilar added that adorable pie. Um, so that will help uh, everyone remember. But this is SMART goals in Spanish. Um, so those of you who had your training in Spanish, you might already be uh, familiar with this, but basically, you know, we have our specific, measurable, uh, achievable, realistic, timely, um, específico, mensurable, puntual, alcanzable, importante, um, way to set up that part of your visit where you're goal setting. All right, and now I will pass it off to wonderful co-facilitator, Yahaira. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for um, thank you for joining this this call. Um, I'll be focusing on clinical scripts in Spanish. We oftentimes, at least when um, Clarissa mentioned that many of us did not have supervision in Spanish, and I also am not I am one person who didn't have too much supervision in Spanish. So. I, I, looking back at my training, I wish I would have had some script, something that I could have just kind of ran with when uh, working with my patients. So hopefully some of these resources might be helpful. Um, I do want to have a small disclaimer. I, it looks like my spell check, even after I switched it to Spanish, didn't work all the way. So please forgive any typos. Promise we know how to spell, but um, you know spell check. So before we get to that, it's, I think it's worthwhile speak, uh, just taking a look at this slide on palabras y frases de uso frecuente when we're working with many of our Spanish-speaking uh, communities. And keeping in mind that the Latino community, as you all know, is very heterogeneous. So that means that we can't, like not everybody in the Latino community is going to use the same language. I mean, the same, the same is said about the population in the U.S., right? There are different idioms and, and phrases that people use. And so the same thing with our Spanish speaking communities. So this is just a, a small list of the many words and phrases or idioms that we have commonly heard in our settings. And depending on your region, depending on the nationalities that you tend to work most with, I would either add some of, the, some of that language to, to this slide for yourselves. Um, but I think it's a nice thing to just kind of start looking at and start to reflect on what are the common words, phrases, idioms that you're hearing from the populations with whom you're working. I really like to point out the very last bullet, no estoy loca o no estoy loco, um, because I am almost, I, I, I feel like I could almost bet on the fact that all of you have heard this at some point from a patient. So it just kind of tells us a lot about how to even start talking about the behavioral health services that we offer. And so let's go ahead and get to um, some of those scripts. First script is on, on la depresión. And I do want to give credit to um, the Hunter et al. text. I think that this is my, like my go-to book. This is like my Bible when it comes to uh, providing services in the IPC setting just because all the work's been done, why reinvent the wheel? So I've actually, the way that I've worked is I've, usually, I've used a lot of their materials and tried to translate it to meet the needs of the patients with whom I work. Um, so obviously you'll, you might uh, read through these scripts and think that there are other ways that you might say something. I'd encourage you to go for it, especially because you know who you're working with. Um, also, you'll notice that in these, in these scripts, I'm not always asking for permission, obviously, I'm assuming that you all, you all will go ahead and do that anyway. Um, another caveat or disclaimer is that the le level of literacy has to be considered. And you might read through these scripts and realize that the level of literacy might be too high or too low. Um, again, this is something for us to be mindful of. And I think as BHCs, we are all very skilled in adapting things for our patient population. So it really is up to us to make that appropriate, the appropriate cultural adaptations necessary to um, so knowing what idioms to use, what words to use instead, while also recognizing that those adapt, ad, ad, sorry, those adaptations we've made might not apply to everybody. Um, so to start off, this is just a basic psycho, this is basic psycho ed on the depression spiral or the depression cycle. And these are some handouts that can be used alongside this psycho ed. 
Nuestra experiencia de vida es afectada por varios factores, incluyendo nuestro ambiente, nuestra biología, nuestros pensamientos y creencias, nuestra conducta y nuestras emociones. Estos factores se afectan el uno al otro. So here, as you can see, we're just kind of setting that, setting that stage for what comes after, afterwards. So vamos a tomar un ejemplo. Supongamos que María aceptó un trabajo que es rápido, movido, y requiere mucho de su tiempo y atención. Este sería el ambiente, el contexto en el que ella, en el que ella vive, en el que sucede todo. El trabajo le produce tanto estrés y ella empieza a tener pensamientos como no hay manera que pueda cumplir todo este trabajo, es imposible, si no lo hago voy a perder mi trabajo. Estos son los pensamientos que la llevan a hacer cambios en su, en su conducta. Quizá ya no esté pasando más tiempo en el trabajo, perdón, quizá ya ahora está pasando más tiempo en el trabajo, no participa en actividades que le gusta, ha dejado de convivir con su familia, amistades y estos cambios en conducta han tenido un efecto negativo en su estado anímico. Se siente más decaída, deprimida, se irrita fácilmente. This is actually an area where you can use some of that language that your patients have fed you. I've had patients talk about, me siento muy apachurrado, me siento muy apachurrada. So this is where I might say, se siente más apachurrada, to start relating that to, to the patient in a way that the patient's really going to get a better understanding of what's going on. Um, todos estos cambios también le están afectando en el sueño y la concentración, lo cual contribuye más a la irritabilidad y la depresión, tanto que se está aislando más y más. Llega el punto en el cual el balance de los químicos en el cerebro también son afectados. Y así es como se fortalece este ciclo de la depresión. So then after that, obviously we ask questions about what are your thoughts about that. And one thing that I like to do with my patients is I like to ask them how this, how, what patterns they've seen in their own lives. And based on what they've told me, we might, we might talk about that depression cycle using their own examples. Um, ¿Cómo rompemos este ciclo? Es difícil cambiar nuestro ambiente y nuestras emociones y pensamientos. Una de las maneras más fáciles para empezar a romper el ciclo de la depresión es enfocándonos en nuestra conducta. Hay bastante evidencia que sugiere que cambiando nuestra conducta y nuestros hábitos tienen un gran efecto en la depresión. Pero, ¿por dónde empezamos? Una de las cosas más importantes que podemos hacer es aumentar nuestra participación en actividades que disfrutamos y nos traen satisfacción. ¿Qué piensa usted acerca de esto? ¿Qué, idea, qué ideas tiene usted? ¿Qué podría empezar a hacer usted? ¿Qué cambios podría hacer para empezar a, a, a interrumpir ese ciclo de la depresión? So, I mean, again, these are things that you're probably already doing with your English-speaking patients, right? But you'll find ways to also adapt it for your Spanish-speaking patients, ways that will make it a little bit more culturally relevant for them, using the appropriate language for them. So I think one, one way to think of this is that this is maybe just kind of like a starting place. And again, I do, I do want to say that this entire script is in English in the Hunter et al. book. Um, and it's kind of a direct translation of that book in Spanish. So I do want to give credit where it's due. Um, so it might not come as a surprise to you all that Latinos also experience uh, pain. Interestingly enough, um, there has been a meta-analysis that showed that Latinos are, have greater sensitivity to pain, but they're also less likely to, to it present with pain conditions, whether it's acute or chronic pain conditions. And this is just something for us to keep in the back of our minds um, when we are meeting with patients, to think about how they are perceiving pain, what cultural factors might be accounting for that. Because after all, at the end of the day, Latinos are tend to be, um, there's a greater likelihood of, of Latinos working in, in manual and blue collar labor, putting them at greater risk of injury and subsequent pain, right? So something for us to think about when working with our patients. And actually, I would say that this is one of the reasons why providing psychoid about chronic pain is really important. Um, some of you might also have noticed that there tends to be a lower preference for opioids among many of our Spanish-speaking patients. I have seen this anecdotally. I think the data also suggests some of this. And I think that's why some of this psychoid might be especially important for patients when we start talking about what are the factors that play into our perception and our experience of pain. Um, so these next couple slides, um, I won't necessarily read through them, but they do touch on the fact that there are multiple psychological factors that 
that contribute to this experience. This one talks about pain blocking. And this next one talks about the, the, the uh, phenomenon of phantom limb pain. And this is something that can get our patients to start thinking about the fact that pain is not something that occurs in the vacuum, but rather that it really is an interplay of multiple factors, including these psychological factors. And this, is actually, this actually takes us to this, uh, the, gate con uh, the gate control model of pain, which um, is known as la compuerta del dolor, or la teoría de la compuerta del dolor, um, and this handout you'll also notice is actually from the Integrated Behavioral Health and Primary Care textbook by Hunter et al. And it's just been translated into Spanish to provide some kind of, um, some kind of handout that you can provide to your patients. Um, in this one, we're really providing the psychoed so that they get a night, they, they begin to consider what are the things that help them with their pain experience, whether it's um, what, what contributes to increased perception of pain versus decreased perception of pain. Um, haga de cuenta que hay una compuerta entre la localidad de la lesión y el cerebro. Esta compuerta afecta el flujo de las sensaciones dolorosas hacia nuestro cerebro. Si la compuerta está abierta, sensaciones dolorosas fluyen con más habilidad y nuestro cerebro, las regi y nuestro cerebro registrará más dolor. Pero si logramos cerrar la compuerta un poco, las sensaciones dolorosas son bloqueadas y percibimos menos dolor. Muchos factores influyen qué tan abierta o qué tan cerrada está esta compuerta. Emociones negativas abren la compuerta. Percibimos más dolor cuando estamos deprimidos, apachurrados, enojados, ansiosos. Fill in whatever language patients tend to use. Si reducimos la in intensidad de estas emociones, habremos cerrado la compuerta un poco, lo cual reducirá su, el dolor que usted, que usted percibe, ¿no? Um, this is where we can also go on and talk about los pensamientos negativos que también pueden abrir la compuerta. Percibimos más dolor cuando estamos enfocados en el dolor que cuando estamos distraídos y enfocados en otras cosas. También los factores conductuales y físicos abren y cierran la compuerta. Por ejemplo, si uno es bastante inactivo porque el caminar y hacer ejercicio produce dolor, los músculos pierden fuerza lo que lleva a uno a tener más dolor. Cuando no participamos en actividades que disfrutamos, puede que aumenten la depresión y frustración, el aburrimiento y el enfoque en el dolor. Esto abrirá la compuerta, permitiendo que aún más sensaciones nos lleguen al cerebro. Obviously, these are scripts that you kind of have memorized, though, um, so that you're not reading straight from a paper the way that I'm reading right now, which does not sound very genuine when you're talking about with a patient. But this is, um, I think this is a, a script that really facilitates this conversation with your patients um, so that they get a better idea and you can start exploring with them um, how to go about making those necessary changes to help with their, with their management of chronic pain. Um, diabetes is, um, I would say, raise your hands if you've worked with someone who has diabetes, Norma raised her hand. It's <laughs> something that we see very frequently and something that many of our patients, especially who, those who have been newly diagnosed, come in with. Um, and many of the patients who I've worked with don't really have a clear understanding of what diabetes is or what exactly is going on. So, so, so understanding the lifestyle changes can be really difficult um, or more likely than not, they are also very daunting. Parece que se siente un poco abrumado, agobiado por todos los cambios que su médico le ha pedido para manejar el diabetes. ¿Qué cambio le ha pedido que considere? Um, obviously, your patient provides the response and you provide that support, right? Wow, eso sí es, son bastantes cambios. Entiendo ahora por qué usted se ha de sentir de esta manera. Y al mismo tiempo estoy notando que usted con, reconoce que es importante hacer estos cambios y reconoce que mantener el mismo ritmo de vida puede resultar en complicaciones de salud a largo plazo. Lo bueno es de que muchos de estos efectos negativos se pueden prevenir a través de cambios en la conducta. Claro, hay algunas cosas que están fuera de su control, pero también hay cosas que están dentro de su control que le ayudarán a mantenerse saludable por mucho más tiempo. Tengo algunas sugerencias para cambios que podrían ayudarlo a manejar su diabetes y a tener una vida larga y más saludable. Um, here we go on to provide some of those uh, suggestions. And I think here is a great way to 
kind of work with the patient to identify things that work for them in the in the way that's culturally relevant for them in the way that also uh, also meets their needs as far as what their current lifestyle is and what their family demands are. As usual, we obviously ask folks, ¿qué le parecen estas dos sugerencias? ¿Qué preguntas tiene? ¿Por qué cree que sería importante enfocarse en estas áreas? Um, and then this other one, and you all will obviously have access to this stuff, um, which is why I'm not reading through all the, all the scripts. But this is Leaves on the Stream um, in Spanish. Uh, this one was one that after a while I just finally had to translate myself because it was getting really challenging to try to do it on the fly. So I actually had to create something for myself to try to just kind of help me as I, as I work with patients. Um, and I don't know if you, about, about you all, but I've actually searched this online and it's not available for free. I think you have to pay to have Leaves on the Stream in Spanish. So here you all, for free, modify as needed. Um, the way I might introduce this one, though, is to just kind of give them a brief overview of how this exercise might be useful for them. Tener pensamientos, ya sean positivos o negativos, es normal. No hay nada malo con esto. Después de todo, gracias a nuestra habilidad de pensar, somos una especie exitosa en el aspecto evolucionario. Por eso hemos llegado donde estamos el día de hoy. El problema sucede cuando estos pensamientos que tenemos se convierten en parte de uno mismo, ¿no? O sea, cuando creemos todo lo que pensamos, por ejemplo, eres una inútil, no sirves para nada. El caso es que estos pensamientos suelen ser pensamientos pegajosos. El propósito de este próximo ejercicio, Hojas en el Arroyo, es para ayudarnos a reconocer que estos pensamientos no tienen que ser parte de nosotros y que, pode y que podemos dejarlos pasar y tomar su curso y continuar con nuestra vida como nosotros deseamos. This can be a brief introduction for this next exercise of Leaves on the Stream. Um, and I believe that this Leaves on the Stream uh, script is included in the, manual, in the giant uh, PDF file that yes, Norma will we'll, be talking about. Yes, we'll talk more about that soon. It's uh, a treat for y'all. Okay, so I'll go ahead and pass it along. Okay. All right, so now we will talk with the lovely Donna Shainer. Hello everyone, muy buenas tardes. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about something we did at the clinic that I worked at before. I used to work at El Buen Samaritano in um, South Austin, Texas, and um, we started something called the Health Topic of the Month, and this idea came from um, the Hunter book, actually. And you've seen today that the Hunter book is pretty popular. Um, and what we did is, so just a little background, what we were having some challenges with, as many of you uh, may have had challenges with in terms of integration, was that the, B, the BHCs were only being pulled when someone was either crying in the exam room or they had a, you know, a positive PHQ-9 um, or maybe they had experienced trauma. Um, and so the, those are good referrals and there is a lot of other things that the BHCs could help with. And so we wanted to increase our referrals to behavioral health and improve integration and really get everyone to stretch a little bit more. And so we started the health topic of the month. In the book, it talks about doing it every week. Um, that was a little bit difficult for us. So we did a topic of the month and what we did um, was we focused on one particular topic um, and we can go to the next slide. I can show you um, the next slide, please. Um, so one of the things that we uh, Sorry did about that, Donna. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> we did, um, this is something that I'll just give you a couple of kind of why this is so wonderful for us and why it worked. So it definitely increased the referrals for us. It improved integration for us um, as a team among all of the providers. And um, what we did is we said at our, you know, our huddle or our staff meeting, we basically said our problem of the month or our topic of the month is, for example, stress, right? And we created these handouts and um, they'll be available also in the massive toolkit that you'll have. Um, so I translated a lot of this um, from the Hunter book and it's referenced there. But we had the handouts ready um, in the bullpen and we had basically, we ended up creating this little toolkit per issue. So we had stress, headaches, goal setting, insomnia or sleep issues, domestic violence or IPV. 
And what it did is when we did these warm transfers or these case consults, um, we had a set of tools that were that was already there that like we weren't running to our office to go print something out really quick or kind of figuring out how we would translate it um, from English to Spanish. We had the tools already there. And in the staff meeting, what we would do to present the topic of the month, we would say, hey, everyone, our topic of the month is stress or, you know, insomnia or, or whatever it was. And we created a little um, blurb of kind of almost like a commercial, like, did you know that your local behavioral health specialist can help with these issues for your patient and give that to the providers and give them a, a, the, the handouts so they knew what we would be talking about with their patients. And um, they were really easy handouts to have. There were resources that we had just available in the bullpen and we created, um, you know, an area that had all of those topics there and expanded the knowledge for both behavioral health and the PCPs. And we really were able to get a lot of buy-in from patients and from the medical providers to talk about other topics. So we, we address stress, we address um, goal setting, health behavior change, insomnia. Um, we started with insomnia and sleep. That's just an easy one. Um, and it really got our medical providers uh, uh, interested and they would remember, oh, I can get behavioral health for that. And it doesn't have to just be when someone is um, crying in the exam room. And I think we really improved integration um, that way, we're, we were definitely utilized a lot more. Um, and our patients really, really enjoyed having something that they would walk away with on the, on the same day. So they had their medical visit, we would go in and do this case consult or worm transfer, and um, they had something in their hands, whether it was, you know, what to do about sleep, you know, sleep hygiene handout, or um, how to set some goals. And we had something that they were walking away with, and they really liked that. Um, and um, yeah, and I think the other thing is just that it, it is, it's something that uh, um, everyone got really excited about and our numbers increased quite significantly. We had more patients that were being seen and um, our, our patients improved in terms of, um, they were seeing some, because we we're doing a quick intervention, they were able to, to improve um, and we could see the benefits from that. And um, you can skip to the next slide also. And this is just another example here, for example, um, we did a, when we did stress as one of our health topics of the month, this is um, one of the ones that we translated. Um, the, the one on the left is, this is something that we use a lot in our, um, our patients, especially the ones that said, no, pues, no estoy loco, no soy loca, you know, or having panic attack symptoms or just um, difficulty regulating. Them seeing an actual, like a body and, and me reading through this, um, with the patients about some of the symptoms that they might be presenting with um, was really helpful. And I could tie that with our, our deep breathing expert exercises um, and how to self-regulate. So this is just an example of just something I could give to them in the exam room. They were really, really happy with this. Um, and, and one felt validated, you know, that whatever was going on with them, you know, wasn't all in their head, quote unquote. And um, they also had some tools to, to feel better. So um, in your, your, tool, your toolkit, you'll have some other tools around. Um, there's other kits for topics of the month, um, and most of them come from the, the Hunter book that have been translated um, for you. Thank you. I think that's all for me. Thank you so much, Donna. It's really great to see how that came together and how you were able to put it in action. And I think uh, for me, that's really inspirational and, and shows us how integration can really make a difference and gives me hope for, you know, my clinic that is still working on, on getting to that point. Um, so, uh, again, here's a picture of all our lovely uh, speakers today. And um, so, uh, Yahida, give you like the teaser of what's coming up. Um, so, we compiled many of these resources into what I called El Manual Gigante because it is a whopping 80 pages. So prepare uh, to receive that. I believe uh, Miss uh, Liana will post it to the PCBH website. Is that possible still, Miss Liana? Yes, that's correct. And then I'll have the link available so that you can send that out if you'd like to send it to the list too. Oh, wonderful. And so, yes, the work group continues. Yahida and I will be meeting next week. And then there is a part two of our webinar that um, Dr. Aguilar is developing. And she left us a quick 
blurb to read about it. So I'm just going to mention this to you now. Um, so it will be on February 20th, and this webinar hopes to be a discussion that leads us in the right direction um, and helps us to be aware of and think about the complex contextual, environmental, and systemic variables that affect behavior change. So this next webinar will speak to the larger issues that affect BHC work with populations uh, that speak Spanish. For example, the psychological variables related to immigration and trauma, the impact of poverty and scarcity on self-efficacy and behavior change. And the title, uh, which references a tanda, the, and she said the good kind of tanda, is a shout out to the cultural practices that evolve to help families and communities thrive and succeed. We are excited about this movement and also a shout out for the next PCBH SIG membership call is January 22nd, 2020, and everyone is invited to attend. And let's see, here are our lovely references. If y'all want to uh, take a little screenshot of this, but um, the PowerPoint will also be made available because there's just a lot of good stuff on here too. So from me and Yahida, muchísimas gracias, and tengan una linda noche. Oh yes, and questions and answers. I'm so sorry. Who has a question? Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for our lovely speakers? Let's see, would we be able, yes, you will get the slides. And can we get the link? Email to us. Miss Kelly, what are you, which link are you referring to? Oh, Q&A. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Hello, how can you subscribe to the listserv? Oh, so that's something that we are working on. Um, uh, Yahida and I will meet about that next week. We can get a listserv going through CFHA. And let's see, links for screeners and resources. Yes, so we will be sending out the PDF and leaves on a stream is part of the PDF, Miss Kelly. Thank you for clarifying that. And can we send you guys translated materials to be added? Of course you can, Yarlene, it's good to see you. Well, sort of, <laughs> you know, see your name on there. And let's see. Great, there you go. Great, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. All right, anything else? Any lingering questions? All right, well, I'm so happy that you all were able to be here with us. There was um, a question. Oh, come on down, question. Oh, here we go, Alan. How can you get more exposure to possible trainings you may have attended that help with learning to conduct therapy in Spanish? Um, well, one of the things that, I, I think that's a, that's a great point uh, or a great question. One of the things that Norm and I have been talking about um, as our goals for this, for this work group and hopefully a SIG at some point is to have more of this available during the during CFHA to have the opportunity mm -hmm. to have workshops that allow you to to pick each other's brains to practice yes. interventions in Spanish so that you can mm -hmm. so that you can feel more comfortable doing this with your patients. Um, so that is something that we've been talking about and hopefully it will be hopefully it will be possible. Um, otherwise like Norma said, I think um, it sounds like Norma's working really hard to get some kind of repository place yes. or, or like a website mm -hmm. for people to have access. And I'm sure that this will be a place where we can also post things like that. Yes. And we're also looking at providing that kind of training or exposure at, at different levels. So, um, and this is something more that Yahida and I will talk about next week and with CFHA about having um, quick note videos. So those are about, you know, 10, 10 minute videos of a skill. And I know, uh, Yarlene, you were interested in that. Um, so like, how do you um, talk about 
you know, grief in like a 10 minute visit? Or do you conduct a mocha in like a 10 minute visit in Spanish, you know? Um, so using different um, interventions and just having them hosted like on the web, things that are, you know, you can watch like, um, what is it like Bauman and Beachy always have those great videos. So it's like, well, let's have some of those too, but in Spanish. Um, and then I know Dr. Aguilar too, she's very invested in um, exploring training opportunities. So yes, I, I will say that Alan, it is, it is on its way, it is, it is coming. Thank you for asking. And Cynthia, any work being done with EMDR? Oh, I have no idea, Miss Cynthia. I'm sorry about that. Um, that would be something that we can check into. I can tell you that uh, this is Donna speaking, but I, uh, I was trained in EMDR and we did have a couple scripts in Spanish um, that I can probably share um, if I look in, in my stuff, but um, it is, it was very challenging to find EMDR scripts in Spanish. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Donna. Yeah. Yeah. Seems to be a theme. It's hard to find these, you know, um, evidence-based or these tried and true proven interventions in Spanish, uh, which is something that I think yeah, Haida and I have as a goal to, to remedy, to have that repository <laughs> of good things. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, what's our time check? Okay, anything else? You have about four more minutes. And then the PowerPoint, um, Maria, I think that will be on the website as well. Well, can we put the PowerPoint on the website, Liana? Yes, so I'll have the link to um, the video, this video itself with the slides and the audio, and then you can also have a link to the PowerPoint. Wonderful, um, thank you. First thing. <laughs> And that'll be under our monthly webinar archives page for those who look for it. Okay, great. So it'll be on the, the PCBH page under the monthly webinar archives. And then I'm still um, piecing together our informal uh, page, the bilingual BHC website. Um, so it's there, but slowly, slowly growing and going. Um, so thank you for your patience with that. Oops. And then just another quick shout out to our references. In case you, I'm sure everyone, well, has some of this, some of these books or all of them in their little BHC library. All right, my dears, thank you again so much for being here with us. Uh, we're all super excited. And we hope to see you all again in February. Have a beautiful evening.